Knuckles Comic Issue 7 We started out with someone wearing a strange mask that reminds me of the Agent Walkers, saying that he's been searching long and hard for Dimitri, and now it's time for him to return home. Basically, an idiot who thinks it's a good idea to release a sealed evil in the can. He looks like he's being reflected in a green Chaos Emerald. So was Dimitri sealed in the Emerald? I thought he got shot up into outer space. And he did. Dimitri says to him that he must let his energy flow through him, as I wonder how he found Dimitri in the first place, and doing so provides the beacon allowing the space shuttle Dimitri to return back to where it started. And again, I have to ask, if he's so damn powerful, why didn't he just immediately warp himself back home instead of needing to wait this long? We then see Kragok making a speech to the Dark Legion, talking about restoring a kid society to its natural form, He mentions the statue of the Great Dimitri. Why the hell would the Dark Legion want to honor this guy with a statue after everything he did? Anyways, he's interrupted when the statue gets destroyed, and someone seems to come right out of it, saying that Enerjack has come back, and asking who is the infidel who, before trailing off, as I wonder why they use the word infidel in a Sonic comic. He trails off because he got distracted by the head of the statue of himself, and shows egoism by saying he'd very much like to meet the one responsible for it, actually showing a different personality trait than just wanting to take over the world for once. The Dark Legion immediately voluntarily agreed to be D Dimitri's army, and Enerjack once again plans to take over the world for the sake of taking over the world. I don't know, a kid in nationalism? Is that why these guys don't see why Dimitri's evil? They just see him as a conqueror, and even throughout history, people didn't see conquerors as evil if they were of their country. Meanwhile, Julie feels sorry for Knuckles, showing some humanity to her because he hasn't said much since their first visit to Mobotropolis together. Knuckles explains that he realized, finally, how like Sonic and him are. Unfortunately, it's pretty bare bones, as he's only talking about how Sonic's upset because his parents kept a lot from him just like his have. Or rather, just like his father has. Wait a minute, his parents didn't keep anything from him. Uncle Chuck did. Knuckles, were you even paying attention? Knuckles then naturally complains that everyone is keeping things from him. And it's a pretty good line where he says, I feel like a puppet with everyone pulling the strings. And he can only react to whatever's happening at the moment. Yeah, you know, I'm sure the fans who became tired of the other chitnets would like to agree with you. Although, I feel like this makes him a lot better of an audience surrogate. Because he doesn't know, and neither does the audience. Knuckles complains that it was all so much simpler when all he had to do was guard the Chaos Emerald. Sure, but that wouldn't have made for an interesting story. Especially not interesting enough stories to fill a whole comic. I honestly prefer this over 30 issues of him sitting in front of the Emerald all day, even with the other kid in history. Hell, I find that stuff fascinating. Julie reveals that she has her own eggs, as nobody except for him seems to have much to say to her. Naturally, since she used to be in the Dark Legion, so that'd be kinda awkward. Wait, even the regular folks disapprove of her. She can't even walk the streets without being gawked at or avoided. Oh man, now I really feel sorry for her. I'd ask why they know she's former Dark Legion, but her pointlessly cybernetic dreadlock kinda gives it away. She then says that all she wanted to do was check out where her family used to live. Her family used to live in that hyperzone where Echidnapolis was taken? I thought the Dark Legion was put in a separate zone from that one. Maybe she met her ancestors all the way back then. But she should have said ancestors then. Knuckles apologizes that he hadn't thought about how others would react to her. It's nice of him to show sympathy like that. And he decides to go see Archimedes for a suggestion. Unless that suggestion is a magic spell that can rewire everyone's brain to be more accepting of her, I doubt he'll be able to help. Meanwhile, we see Archimedes saying that he came to his grandpa as soon as he called. Well, I say see, but I can barely see them at first because they're just tiny specks in front of a TV monitor in Haven. Archimedes' grandfather says that it may be too late because something bad's gonna happen soon, but gets interrupted by loud noise before he can explain itself further, as Enerjack shows up coincidentally right in the perfect spot for him and says that there won't be any cute disappearing acts on their part this time. How is he gonna get rid of their overpowered teleportation powers? No, instead he just restrains them so that they can't even move, because I guess they need to be able to move to teleport. Enerjack then leaves instead of crushing them, I guess because he's planning to have them die a more slow, painful death of exposure from them being unable to move to feed themselves, but it would've been smarter to just kill them right away. 
Then we cut to the leader of the Dingoes, who has come to the Echidna Polis Council, saying that his people are tired of living in tents. I like how the bearded leader Echidna admits that he actually feels sorry for them instead of not caring about them at all. Maybe he's lying, but deeply sympathized with their plight is a little much for that. He then gives the news that their construction team is working as fast as they can. So the Echidna's banned technology to live like the ants, but construction technology is just fine. It makes logical sense, but then at least clarify that they've officially become more flexible with the technology ban instead of having confusing hypocrisy. The leader of the Dingoes fails to understand, and an Echidna woman in a nice green dress calls the Dingoes out on never attempting to establish peaceful relations with the Echidnas in the past. The Dingo leader first insists on being referred to as General because he's an arrogant dick, and then says that the situation has changed to be more in the Echidna's favor, and asks what more he could do to appease them further. Of course he's lying when he promises to have his people lay down their weapons. Meanwhile, Chuckles ex Knuckles explains to Julie that the part of Lava Reef Zone they're in don't get many visitors, and they prefer it that way. As I guess from Knuckles saying that those people enjoy this kind of environment, he's talking about the Fire Ants. Wait, if the ant people have been helping out Echidnas for the sake of it for generations, centuries even, why have they now become isolationists and hating visitors? Well, obviously it's gotta be because most of the other living creatures tower over them, and so they don't want to risk getting stepped on. Knuckles finds out that people haven't heard from Archimedes in a long time, and then Lara Sue is shown naturally being pretty sad, saying that I can't have Knuckles thinking his mother didn't want him, and being comforted by her new husband. I like this guy already! After she decides to have a talk with her ex-husband about her son, which I sympathize with her for because that's gotta be awkward for her, we cut to Knuckles walking with Julie in Rainbow Valley, annoying me by talking extensively about the place being colorful when it looks no more colorful than any other tropical jungle. Right now I'm thinking of that place where the Flickies ate gemstones, and it looked way more colorful than this. It's explained that the chameleons live here, and Knuckles says that with their ability to blend into their surroundings, this area was a natural for them to settle in. Except I don't see how a colorful area would be easier to camouflage yourself in than every other area ever, since they can turn invisible wherever they want. Knuckles says that the chameleons don't want to show themselves to strangers, and then shouts up Espio's tree asking if he's home. Unless he lives in a treehouse, that must be a pretty miserable home. No bed, no indoor plumbing, no roof. As I expected, Espio isn't home either, getting Knuckles worried. Then I get really confused by seeing Grandpa Hawking in a hospital bed sleeping when I thought that he stayed in the collapsing hyperzone to press the button sending Echidna Polis back home, sacrificing his life in the process. But now it turns out he's still alive. But now I'm wondering why he's in this condition in the first place, if he somehow survived the collapsing zone at all. I think he'd either have died or been perfectly fine. The doctor, the grandson of him, makes mental contact using a device that allows him to talk to him even though he's unconscious. And this time it's perfectly believable because it's kidna technology, which is better than Dr. Quack magically making something like this. Also, I guess medical technology is another exception to the technology ban. It makes sense. Grandpa Hawking doesn't really care whether or not he survives because he's done enough in his lifetime, which is pretty depressing. After Locke, well, I'm not sure what happened there. We cut back to Julie, who somehow needs special climbing equipment to climb up the mountain and follow Knuckles. I always thought it was a trait of all Echidnas being able to climb up mountains with their bare hands. Then again, I just noticed Knuckles seems to be the only Echidna who has spiked gloves like that, so maybe that's it. As the two of them arrive at a cave, and I wonder how they knew to go to this particular location, we then cut again to some Dark Legion members at night, talking about how Kragok has been with Dimitri all day. I have no problem with Kragok being made subservient to Dimitri this easily, because he's been shown to be a pretty weak and ineffectual villain so far, doing nothing but running away from Knuckles, making his men fight him for him, and then losing a fight and running away again. It's a smart thing to do, but either way he proved he was the main villain material, so this hurts him a lot more. This seems to be able to be pointless, as all it does is remind you that Dimitri is going to spring a trap on Knuckles. Yeah, go figure, I could have thought of that. It's just like the Eggman scenes in the modern Sonic games, they're all padding. They're just meant to build up suspense, but they're all about telling you something's going to happen that you're going to see anyways. Meanwhile, we see Knuckles and Julie searching through a stone house for some reason. Julie makes a reckless mistake by snarking that she's finding the circling so tedious that she'd almost rather be his enemy. Dude, that is not something you want to say to a former enemy who doesn't trust you yet. 
It's like it's so instinctive for her to be snarky that she doesn't know when to exercise caution. Fortunately, it's not too big of a deal, as they simply go into their typical light bickering, with Knuckles saying he still doesn't know if she's his friend yet, even though he introduced her to the Freedom Fighters as such, and Julie snarking, what, I now have to take an oath of loyalty or something? That would be a good start. Knuckles then runs out of the stone house in a hurry, calling Julie Babe for some reason. I wouldn't expect that on Knuckles. And jumps off a cliff, just barely giving Julie the time to grab onto him as he glides to safety. If he had done that at the wrong time, like too fast or something, you'd think that he would have to go all the way back to her saying, Oops, I forgot about you, and then waste a whole bunch of time. Mammoth Mongol? I didn't even notice that the first time. Good thing, too, because it would have ruined the surprise for me. Then Enerjack shows up at exactly the right time and place once again, as if he knew where everyone was on the whole island at all times and grabs Knuckles after Knuckles tries to tell Julie to run for her life. This story by Ken Penders had a lot of cuts in it. There were so many different points of view switched to, it was a little hard to keep track of. But that does make sense considering that Knuckles' story only consisted of him wandering around the island looking for his friends, and that would have been boring as shit. So we needed other stories to make things interesting. Plenty of stories do that. I found Jack being revived and brought back to be extremely arbitrary. No sane person would decide to help him like that. And I felt that the Grandpa Hawking not caring if he lives or dies thing was a bit too dark. I didn't like the situation. It... Like, I like Sonic because it helps me escape from reality. But I liked how Knuckles' his mother decided to further the ongoing arc with her by talking with her husband about her son, rather than that being completely forgotten. And I much prefer Kragok as a subordinate to Enerjack, a true strong antagonist. It is a shame too because I found Kragok really intimidating at first, but he's just not enough of a threat. And that's fine. It doesn't ruin his character or anything. He is what he is. The story was alright, but underwhelming. Not much really happened in it. I was expecting the Freedom Fighters to show up in this issue, since they've been called here in the previous one in the main comic. But if Knuckles gets captured by Interjack at the end of this issue, how is he able to call them for help? 